Welcome to the third class in this course. Uh, in the last class, we are talking about uh, uh, DG technology trends, especially related to uh, power electronic uh, applications and the content of power electronics in DG technology. Uh, we are talking about uh, uh, internal combustion engines, uh, combined heat and power, then uh, micro turbines. That was where we left, and uh, so today we'll. Uh, complete that particular discussion we had. We will look at uh, fuel cells and energy storage elements and uh, take it from there. So, if you look at uh, uh, this, uh, these systems in general, both, uh, 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 both the sources uh, such as what we discussed in the last class and also storage elements are important, especially in uh, distributed generation where both the load and the source can potentially be intermittent. And uh, not just that, many uh, uh, sources do not have very high bandwidth to track the instantaneous power requirement by loads. So, the storage part of it is also an important uh, aspect of uh, distributed generation. If you look at uh, fuel cells, uh, uh, the fuel input for the cell stack is typically hydrogen and uh, at times uh, it could be other gases such as methane. There are a variety of uh, fuel cells depending on the material technology that goes in. You have solid oxide fuel cells that operate at high temperature, you have phosphoric acid based fuel cells, then proton exchange membrane which operates at a comparatively lower temperature. For example, people are looking at PEM variety for transportation type of application where the temperature is not very high, whereas for stationary applications uh, having something hot can be more easily handled in a stationary system. So, people have looked at uh, higher temperatures to get the benefits of uh, the uh, system such as solid oxide. If you look at uh, the early applications of fuel cells, they have been used in uh, space applications for generating power uh, and there the cost was not that much of a constraint in applications such as uh, space, but when you bring it to the distributed generation or transportation type of application, then cost uh, is extremely critical. And as we discussed in an earlier uh, class, the lifetime of uh, power generation equipment uh, has to be quite long if you want to compete with uh, existing systems. So, people are developing fuel cells for stationary power application, for automotive and also fuel cells for uh, mobile type of application where the amount of uh, power that would be available on a fuel cell based uh, mobile phone or a laptop would be much longer than what you could have from a battery based uh, a mobile uh, uh, computing platform. If you look at uh, the, uh, the fuel cell itself, the individual cells, cells are low voltage and they need to be stacked to get the higher voltage. This, the, so, similar to what you would do in a battery. Uh, the fuel cell today is uh, in a transportation application is not cost competitive with uh, the IC engine technology, but people are working on issues related to fuel cells. If you look at the fuel cell, you can think of it as a evolution of a energy storage system. If you look at a primary cell, it is a electrochemical energy storage system that can be used uh, once. So, uh, when it is dead, you throw out the primary cell battery and you buy and replace it with a new cell. If you look at a secondary cell, it is a electrochemical storage device that can be recharged. So, your rechargeable battery is a secondary cell, but uh, use once and throw is a primary cell. If you look at a fuel cell, it is a electrochemical energy converter with a fuel as the feed rather than having to electrically recharge. Okay. Uh, if you think of hydrogen, it is not a primary energy source in the sense that hydrogen is not freely available as an element. So, you have to generate hydrogen out of something and uh, you would have to do, you could do say electrolysis of water uh, 
or you could uh, reform natural gas to get hydrogen. Uh, if you look at uh, the, ener uh, the energy storage, uh, the fundamental element of it, if you look at uh, what is there in something like a capacitor, the electron is the unit of uh, energy which carries the energy in a capacitor. If you think of about a fuel cell, you could think of a proton being the carrier of the energy and it is the pro proton flowing through the membrane through the cell which actually generates the uh, net electrical power in the fuel cell stack. Uh, also, uh, you can think of the hydrogen then to be the stored form of the energy carrier which is the proton. Okay. Uh, also, the hydrogen does not occur in the natural form, so it has to be converted from other elements. So, these are things that uh, become important how efficient is each part of this conversion process to actually uh, get your useful electricity or uh, useful energy out of such a fuel cell. Okay. If you look at the common energy storage uh, components uh, today, uh, electrical energy storage uh, at the scale of distributed uh, generation level, you have batteries, the most common application of a battery is a UPS system uh, and you can have a variety of batteries depending on the chemistry. You have lead acid which has been around for a long time. You have the flooded lead acid cells, you have the uh, maintenance the, the batteries which need less maintenance like the valve regulated cells, you have tubular batteries etcetera. Those are all lead acid uh, based chemistry. Uh, the initial uh, uh, electric vehicles had you uh, looked at uh, nickel metal hydride as an option uh, uh, because it has higher cycle life compared to the lead acid cells and uh, people of late are focusing on the lithium ion technology. Other ways of storing energy in uh, uh, at a distribution level would be uh, could be flywheels, people have looked at flywheels, uh, ultra capacitors. Uh, again, if you have uh, a system where you could produce hydrogen and consume hydrogen, you could think of the fuel cell as a energy storage element where the storage uh, capacity depends on your storage capacity of hydrogen. Okay. People have also looked at other methods like compressed air etcetera and for all these systems you are you would require power electronics to interface the storage element with the AC electric grid. If you look at specifically the battery technology, uh, there are many challenges in batteries. Uh, uh, the lead acid is a mature technology today uh, and uh, cost wise it is quite com uh, competitive compared to the other challenging uh, battery technologies. Uh, however, there are challenges of how to estimate the state of charge. Uh, for example, if you are using it in a vehicle application, you would like to know when your fuel uh, gauge is empty or whether it is full. You would also like to know how to how much charge or how much discharging can be done on a from the battery. It depends on aspects like the state of charge, your temperature, uh, uh, what is the expected cycle life that you are targeting etcetera. So, that can be a challenge in a battery. If you have a typical application, you might not have uh, single cells, but you might have a bank of uh, uh, batteries and cell balancing becomes an important issue because you do not want to be constrained by the weakest cell in the overall bank. You want to actually make the maximum use of your cells in the bank and uh, so uh, cell balancing becomes an important issue. If you look at cycle life, uh, cycle life is a challenge in a battery especially if you are looking at lead acid type of batteries, you are looking at uh, hundreds of uh, cycles. Uh, in something like lithium ion, you, are, you might be able to get uh, 1000 or few thousand range, but uh, the cycle life uh, is something that is uh, important in a battery application. Also voltage matching is important. If you look at typical uh, 230 volts or 415 volt uh, AC systems, uh, without a transformer, if you want to connect a battery to the AC grid, you will need a, a fairly large number of cells to be connected in series. So, the method to get 
the voltage matching between your AC and DC side is an uh, important concern and of course the inverter for generating the AC output. Okay. Uh, if you look at uh, the uh, emerging battery technologies such as lithium ion, uh, it is uh, having a much higher initial cost compared to the lead acid cells that are available today. If you look at flywheels today, uh, flywheels are uh, machines that operate at uh, uh, fairly high uh, uh, speeds. Uh, if you look at the amount of energy stored in a flywheel, it is proportional to the square of its uh, speed. So, you typically try to apply as large an RPM as possible. So, people use it in tens of thousands of RPM to hundreds of thousands of RPM. Uh, recent papers in uh, journal of uh, mechanical engineering journals uh, show that people have done prototype flywheels that go even up to a million RPM. Okay. So, the, uh, the technology required to actually hold a mechanical structure uh, uh, without falling apart at those high RPM is actually a, a big challenge. So, the mechanical consideration is a big issue. So, if you look at the energy stored, uh, just increasing the inertia of the flywheel will give you a linear uh, dependence with, uh, with the inertia, whereas if you look at the RPM, it is quadratic. So, pushing uh, the RPM can actually have uh, benefits. And if you look at the power electronics required for uh, controlling a flywheel system, it is essentially a regenerative motor drive. So, when you are sending power out to the machine, uh, you are uh, actually driving the machine and when you want to take power out, you are actually regenerating and taking power from your st stored energy in the inertia and putting it back into your electrical system. If you look at uh, the ultra capacitor as an energy storage element, people are looking at ultra capacitor closely today, ultra capacitors closely today because its ability to a charge and discharge is much higher than a battery. So, people are looking at possible combinations of ultra capacitors and batteries to be able to rapidly charge and discharge energy. Uh, so, compared to a regular capacitor, uh, these ultra capacitors can have much higher value of uh, capacitance. Uh, so, you are talking about devices that can have hundreds, 100 farads capacitance or uh, uh, so, many, many, many farads compared to the microfarads uh, range that you would typically deal with uh, say polypropylene capacitors or maybe even millifarads in electrolytic capacitors, but it is not typical to have farads of uh, capacitance in an uh, ordinary uh, capacitor. Uh, so, there is also a lot of work going on in the material. Uh, technology, the type of uh, porous carbon to increase the surface area to get higher capacitance. People are looking at things like uh, nanotubes to increase the value of the capacitance. So, there is a range of uh, material and uh, structural uh, properties that people are looking at from the actual uh, ultra capacitor, the, the device point of view. If you are looking at it from the power electronic uh, converter, uh, what you would essentially need is uh, a bidirectional DC to DC converter. So, to charge the, uh, the ultra capacitor, maybe you would use a buck converter to send energy from your, your uh, DC voltage to your ultra capacitor and maybe you would use a boost converter to send the energy from your ultra capacitor back to your DC side. So, essentially uh, you would typically use uh, a power electronic system as an integral component, component of a ultra capacitor system. So, if you look at uh, the distributed generation and storage uh, devices, uh, people call them distributed resources to indicate it is both generation and storage. Uh, the power electronics form uh, integral part of many of these systems and uh, understanding both the source element and the grid to which uh, it is connected is important for uh, a successful design of the overall distributed uh, energy resource system. 
Okay. So, if you look at uh, the overall uh, distributed energy uh, system, you might think about three elements the, the DG source, you might have your uh, power conditioning you might have your uh, grid it might be the distribution grid and uh, if you look at these three these are three critical elements of uh, your overall DEG system the source there are a variety as we just discussed uh, uh, right now and in the last class. Uh, if you look at the other aspect of the DG system, you are looking at the power conditioning which might be a machine or an inverter and you are looking at the distribution grid and overall uh, the distribution uh, grid and the power conditioning system falls clearly in the electrical domain. So, we could look at uh, these two aspects uh, more closely uh, and try to keep it uh, technology neutral irrespective of the type of source, what aspects of power conditioning, what aspects of the, uh, the grid are critical for DG technology. And uh, the DG source, to go into the DG source, you will have to look at the materials, the construction, fabrication process. So, the focus of our course would be in the first part, we will look at the grid and then in the second part we will look at the power conditioning in terms of the inverter. Okay. So, next we will look at the, the, uh, the grid aspects uh, now. So, if you look at uh, a typical uh, distribution system, uh, you are uh, having a, a wide range of components. Okay. If you look at the typical system, you might start off uh, from the substation. Uh, before the substation, you have the tra transmission system, the sub transmission system etcetera. Uh, so, the, what comes into the substation is the high voltage uh, 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 aspects and then you would have the transformers at the substation uh, followed by the low voltage bus and then you would have feeders going out uh, from your substation to your actual consumption points. So, the substation would consist of say your transformer, uh, you might have tap changes to ensure that your uh, feeder voltage stays constant irrespective of the voltage which might go up and down at the transmission level. You would have uh, uh, the, the substation bus, you might have uh, breakers at, uh, at individual feeders, uh, you might have some line voltage regulators, sometimes the line voltage regulators might be located further down in the line. So, essentially these components form the main portions of the substation. Okay. If you look at the distribution line itself, the feeder, you have the circuit breakers uh, at the substation point, you would have the actual line and you might have uh, branches of the line you, uh, or laterals uh, 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 branching out in a radial form, a radial uh, feeder is quite common. You might have uh, capacitors for compensation of uh, reactive power, uh, you would have uh, individual loads fed through distribution transformers that you would see uh, on the streets. Okay. So, the so, you would have the loads which might be connected through uh, the transformers would be protected with fuses, you would have the consumption point, the loads might be at the low voltage level 230 volts. So, you might have a transformer for maybe a set of homes uh, on the street and uh, at the individual homes you would have meters and fuses entering into the home or if it is a commercial establishment. Uh, you might have a transformer for the commercial establishment. So, you could have a variety of combinations of the distribution uh, feeder system. Okay. Uh, the transformers can be of different configurations, you can have different grounding, the, the, uh, the feeders could be overhead lines, it may be bunched uh, uh, conductors uh, in cables, uh, it may be underground cables, uh, there may be different uh, 
varieties of grounding depending on your grounding philosophy at the transformers. So, there can be variations of on this nominal system. Okay. If you look at uh, the typical configuration of this system, it is radial and uh, you would define uh, areas of protection for such a system. Okay. So, you might say you might have a, a zone for protecting So, you might have a zone for say protection of your uh, substation transformer. Okay. So, you might have a zone for uh, say the low voltage bus at the substation. Uh, you can have zones for your individual feeders. You might have zones for your consumption which is which might be at the loads towards the loads. Or it may be towards the laterals etcetera. So, you have areas of protection that are defined for your feeder and uh, uh, these areas of protection are overlapping. So, that you do not leave any particular point vulnerable in the system. So, every part of the system is protected and you give priority for different zones uh, for protection. So, uh, uh, a zone closer up towards the stem of the tree would have higher priority, something closer to the bra end branch and the leaves would have lower priority. Okay. So, something which is at higher priority would have more sophisticated protection systems etcetera. So, for example, you might be put a, a high end uh, protection relay with uh, circuit breakers etcetera at uh, in a higher zone whereas, you might want to look at something more cost effective uh, maybe just a fuse uh, and some uh, arresters for o voltage protection at the uh, other end of the uh, uh, zone of protection. So, uh, so, you have priority for the zones of protection and uh, you also need coordinated protection. Okay. So, for example, uh, if you have a fault in a particular load, you would like the closest protective device to actually open and uh, you want to minimize the balance, the disturbance that you the fault creates to the balance of system. So, for example, if uh, a, a fault is there in zone 4 of this uh, particular system, you would like this particular maybe breaker or fuse to open and you do not want uh, the remaining uh, portions of the feeder or even the adjacent feeders to get disturbed by the fact that you have a fault somewhere there. Okay. Also, you would like to have backup protection in the sense that say for example, if one device uh, fails, you would like to have uh, if possible the closest uh, upstream uh, uh, protection device operate to actually provide a backup so that the fault doesn't spread further up into the system. Okay. So these aspects are quite important for uh, the distribution system. So, if you then look at uh, what are the protective devices that can be used in such a, uh, a distribution system, you have uh, relays uh, and circuit breakers. So, a relay would be you could think of a relay as a, a brain behind the operation of uh, a protective uh, 
switch and the switch is the breaker. So, essentially the relay would command the switch to uh, be on or to be off. So, you might use uh, sophisticated relays at the substation level. Uh, you might have surge arresters uh, distributed uh, through the system to prevent over voltage. You have fuses uh, especially out on the feeder and also as backup components in many, uh, many of uh, the uh, protection devices. So, uh, uh, the fuses are uh, ex uh, comparatively uh, cost effective uh, devices for protection. You have circuit breakers. So, here I have indicated uh, two breakers at the substation transformer. Uh, the actual transformer configuration would depend on your individual substation. You would have uh, breakers feeding the individual feeders that radiate out from the substation. So, you would be able to say operate or disconnect or protect on an individual feeder basis. Okay. Uh, you also have uh, devices such as reclosers, uh, reclosers and sectionalizers. Uh, reclosers uh, are uh, essentially uh, you can think of it as a breaker which uh, has the ability to actually close again after opening. Uh, the reason why people would like to use reclosers is that uh, most uh, faults are actually temporary and uh, so once the fault is cleared you can actually re-energize the line. So, people consider using reclosers rather than some line maintenance person later on coming and manually turning on the line the recloser can actually uh, uh, able uh, can be can actually clear a temporary fault if the fault is continuing eventually the re recloser will lock out. Okay. Uh, sectionalizers are devices that are meant to operate with uh, reclosers and we will see later on in the cor course how uh, sectionalizers and reclosers can be uh, used together for the protection of the feeder. <coughs> If you look at uh, uh, what exactly constitutes a fault, uh, fault could be uh, uh, a fault could be essentially uh, something that is not working. Okay, so what would you think of uh, as a fault? Say it could be. Uh, 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 say uh, a, a short circuit somewhere, it could be uh, a different scenarios, uh, a, 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 a general way of, uh, of describing a fault is uh, a partial or uh, total local failure of insulation or continuity so essentially uh, you could think about uh, electrical systems as uh, essentially consisting of uh, parts which conduct electricity or and parts which would uh, prevent the conduction of, uh, of electricity. So, those are uh, insulating uh, components. So, a component which is supposed to insulate if it fails to insulate you could have essentially a failure in the electrical system or if a component which is uh, expected to conduct electricity fails to conduct. Uh, you would have essentially a fault in the system. So, it is a this is a fairly broad definition and uh, if you look at uh, say for example, uh, uh, an over voltage, okay. a over voltage can happen for a variety of reasons. Uh, I mean a over voltage can actually lead to insulation failure. So, that uh, even an over voltage can actually lead to a fault. So, you want to prevent over voltages in systems. Okay. Uh, so, so, so uh, definition like this is fairly broad rather than just looking at short circuits as the only possible fault. Uh, 
For example, if you look at uh, uh, over voltage that uh, commonly would uh, we would think of uh, that comes to our mind would be a lightning striking a line. Uh, but the interesting thing about uh, lightning striking the line is that say if it uh, strikes a section of the line then you would end up having over voltage in a small section of the line or the feeder and you would have uh, surge arresters, you would have uh, over voltage protection components which are situated close by. You would have uh, if it is a exposed line you would have insulators on the po electric poles and they might arc over. So, often the over voltage caused by lightning uh, is then followed by uh, arcing or uh, essentially short circuit and once you have a short circuit then essentially what people would see is actually uh, the voltage collapsing rather than over voltage. So, immediate in the immediate neighborhood of the lightning you might see an over voltage, but further away in the system what you would see is actually uh, uh, under voltage because you now have uh, uh, lines that are arcing over and then an upstream breaker would open. So, maybe on a section of the feeder you would see over voltage, but on the adjacent feeders and in the further away on the feeder what you would actually see is a under voltage. Okay. So, you will have to look at uh, uh, a combination of uh, uh, what can happen when you look at uh, a fault event on a typical distribution feeder. If you look at uh, uh, the, the nature of what happens when you have a fault, say you have arcing of insulators etcetera, uh, ceramic insulators on a line. Uh, if a arcing is starts on a line, essentially to stop the arcing you have to actually disconnect your de-energize the line by opening an upstream breaker. So, you can think of it as uh, stopping fuel supply to that particular fault point. Once the arc is cleared, then the insulator can recover and actually go back to the normal mode, which is one of the reasons why many of the faults are actually temporary faults. So, you have a system uh, where you are feeding energy, you have a fault, then you uh, stop providing energy to that particular point, then the fault clears away and the system recovers, then you can actually re energize the line. Also, you can have situations where maybe uh, uh, squirrels are coming on the line or uh, a tree branch is touching the line. Uh, if the branch say for example, burns out, then it would stop uh, causing a fault. Okay. So, uh, the uh, many reasons where why you can have uh, say temporary faults. Uh, if you look at continuity of a conductor, uh, what could be the situations where you would have this uh, discontinuity of conductors. We just had the monsoon season, you have heavy rains, say a tree falls on the line, it will snap the line. Okay. Uh, you can have say a vehicle going and hitting a pole, you can have uh, heavy wind or in northern regions you would have ice depositing on lines, increasing the weight causing lines to snap. So, for a variety of reasons you would also have discontinuity of uh, loss of continuity of conductor which can actually uh, 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 be considered a fault and anything which uh, prevents normal operation uh, is something which is undesirable and you would like to actually have uh, a system where you are actually doing what is intended which is delivering power to the loads. So, if you look at uh, the models of the component that go into uh, a system, uh, you want to actually uh, calculate what is a response of a typical system with faults. So, you want to actually model the system, which means that uh, you are looking at how to model the components that we just discussed, which are transformers, uh, your line. Uh, uh, you might have uh, protective devices. So, how should we actually uh, model these components? So, the most common uh, model that uh, you would be or uh, you would have already studied in your undergrad classes uh, is the, the T model of the transformer. Okay. 
you could have variations on, on this depending on the type of transformer, it could be y delta uh, zigzag type of windings, you can have uh, different types of grounding of the transformer. Uh, so, there may be variations on that particular transformer and uh, but the basic model essentially consists of a T section where you would have uh, leakage inductance of the primary, you would have the winding uh, primary winding resistance, uh, you would have leakages of the secondary, you could reflect back that back to the primary side, you would have your magnetizing inductance, you might have uh, core loss uh, resistance terms. And uh, the question is what could be a, a typical uh, value that you could take for such a transformer. Okay. So, if you look at uh, the power rating of a uh, transformer, uh, say for an uh, as an example, maybe uh, uh, if you are looking at uh, a transformer at uh, a sample power rating of uh, say 4 MVA and, uh, and say your turns ratio would correspond to your actual voltage. Uh, say you are talking about 11 kV slash say 415 volt uh, device. So, if you look at your leakage inductance L L from your primary plus uh, reflected secondary, you may be talking in terms of uh, say 4 to 8 percent. If you look at it in terms of what this particular value is on your high voltage side, you are talking about uh, say 0 0.4 to 1.1 milli Henry on your high voltage side. On your low voltage, you are talking about say 0 0.6 to 1.6 micro Henry uh, uh, of uh, inductance. If you if you look at uh, the the resistance of your winding uh, primary plus re reflected secondary, you are talking about uh, 1 to maybe 3 percent depending on how much uh, copper is used in the winding. So, you are talking about say 0 0.3 to 0 0.9 uh, ohms on your high voltage side, whereas you are talking about uh, something like 430 to uh, 1300 micro ohms on the low voltage side. Okay. If you look at something like your magnetizing inductance, uh, you are talking of something much greater than 10 per unit uh, and so here you are talking of greater than 140 milli Henry on the low voltage side on the high voltage side or you are talking about 200 micro Henry's on the low voltage side. Okay. If you are looking at the core loss uh, term, you are talking of something which is greater than uh, 100 per unit. So, you are talking of something greater than 3 kilo ohms on your high voltage side or 4.3 ohms on the low voltage side. So, you can see that uh, if you take a typical parameters of such a transformer, if you look at the physical values of uh, inductance, resistance, etcetera, uh, you do not know when someone says okay, I have uh, something which is uh, 1 milli Henry, uh, you might think it is a high inductance whereas uh, uh, 2 micro Henry's you might think it is small, but if you say it is uh, in a 8 percent, it is the same irrespective of whether you are talking about high voltage or low voltage. So, it makes a lot more sense to talk in uh, uh, percentages or per unit uh, compared to the actual uh, physical unit, because then you would have to look at in with the actual physical unit, what the power rating is, what the voltage level is etcetera. Whereas, uh, talking in terms of percentages or on a per unit basis gives you a more intuitive feel of what typically to expect when you are uh, dealing with a component. Uh, similarly, if you look at uh, uh, the the 
the winding resistance if someone says that the winding resistance is uh, 0.9 ohms or uh, uh, 430 micro ohms you might think that 430 micro ohms is uh, really small but uh, it depends on the voltage level so if you say that the the resistance is 1% then you might say okay that might be a reasonable value uh, if someone says the resistance is 10% you would immediately realize that maybe it is not reasonable it is too large for the winding. So uh, again the value in percentage gives you a, a better gut feel of what to expect in the system rather than uh, uh, the physical units. You might actually make use of the physical units in your actual design procedure but to convey it uh, in a more general manner uh, the percentage or the per unit is uh, uh, a good way of doing it. Again if you look at say the magnetizing inductance uh, say for example if someone says the magnetizing inductance is uh, uh, just uh, 2 per unit uh, I would uh, you can immediately say that uh, that transformer draws a lot of magnetizing uh, reactive uh, uh, wars because that would correspond to 50 percent of uh, its rating would be its no load wars. Whereas if uh, it is 10 per unit it means that the no load current uh, is 10 percent of your rating which might be reasonable. So again just looking at it uh, these components for example if you look at your core loss resistance if it is uh, 10 per unit it means that immediately the core losses is 10 percent of your so your no load losses would be 10 percent which might be immediately considered as unacceptable if you say it is 100 per unit it means that your uh, core loss resistance is uh, 1 per unit uh, which means that uh, 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 your core loss resistance is 1 percent when you have 100 per unit which might be more reasonable. So again uh, the parameters uh, defined on a percentage basis can give you a feel for what is uh, considered acceptable or reasonable and what can be expected on a typical system because often you may not have access to actual data and you want to make estimates of what to expect uh, based on estimated uh, information. So if you look at uh, the, the next important uh, element in our particular system it would be say the actual line. So for the line you would have studied in the power system course there are different models. Uh, lumped models, uh, distributed parameter models, etc. Uh, the distribution line is uh, uh, fairly short compared to long transmission lines, etc. So, lumped parameter models are actually uh, can often be sufficient in uh, your analysis. Okay. Uh, if you are actually using cables rather than overhead lines, then maybe capacitive effects also become important uh, rather than just uh, modeling it as. RL uh, 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 sections or uh, RL components in your distribution line. Your resistance of your conductor depends on the formula for resistance of a conductor it is proportional to length inversely proportional to the area of cross section. So depending on your ampa ampacity of the line you would decide your cross sectional area of the conductor and based on that you can get resistance per unit uh, length of the line it can be uh, of the range of uh, you are talking about uh, 100 milli ohms to half ohm per kilometer again depending on the ampacity of the conductors in, the, in a range such as that. If you look at uh, the, the x by r ratios. If you look at x by r ratios uh, of a line you are talking about uh, a distribution line where the, 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 uh, the impedance uh, uh, the reactance to resistance uh, ratio is of the order of 1. Uh, distribution system is typically much more resistive than a transmission system. So if you look at the x by r ratios of a transmission line you might get numbers such as 3 uh, but distribution lines uh, tend to be uh, uh, much more resistive uh, 
also if you look at uh, uh, the 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 x x zero by uh, x plus uh, this is typically of So, this is typically around uh, uh, around oops. Uh, uh, around 3 for uh, these lines. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, what contributes to th the inductance of, uh, uh, of a line, it is essentially uh, you are looking at how much uh, flux is linked by a loop. Okay. So, if you look at the loop for the conductors of uh, your, your lines, you are talking about loop areas which are smaller, whereas if you are looking at the conductors uh, situ situ sitting on a line uh, and the loop area when you are thinking about the return path through earth, you are looking at a much larger loop for uh, situations such as earth falls. So, you would have higher x naught compared to your uh, uh, x plus in a typical system. So, so, many of these things you can actually link it to the physical lines to determine what the what are reasonable range of parameters of a, uh, uh, a typical line. Also you will have to look at uh, the length of the line if you are looking at uh, uh, typical urban feeders you are looking at shorter uh, distances you are talking about maybe uh, 2 to 4 kilometers uh, whereas, uh, in rural feeders you will have much typically much longer length. So, you are talking about uh, something of the could be 10 kilometers or much larger uh, in uh, uh, really long uh, rural feeders. So, if you look at uh, the, the power quality that you would see in a urban system, you would see uh, lower voltage drops along the line in a urban scenario whereas, in often in a village you might encounter that there is a uh, the lights are not blowing uh, brightly it is quite dim it is because the physical line is actually situated uh, physically so far away and uh, the impedance of that entire line is causing larger voltage drops when people are drawing power. Okay. <coughs> If you look at a typical uh, distribution system, there are a variety of uh, uh, ways of grounding. You have, uh, you can have solid grounding of the transformer. So, people talk about uh, T n networks etcetera, T stands for terra where your neutral is solidly connected to uh, ground. You can have uh, impedance grounding. Uh, people sometimes talk about IT networks where your neutral is connected to terra through uh, impedance. So, people uh, look at things like you might see terms like T n, uh, IT, uh, T T etcetera. So, there are various ways of uh, uh, grounding. Uh, you can have multiple grounding. So, in the systems where uh, maybe each distribution transformer pole you have explicit uh, grounding uh, for your feeder and uh, such systems are common in uh, uh, other parts of the world like North America, Japan etcetera. Uh, uh, so, there are a variety of grounding uh, uh, met, uh, uh, ways for the transformer and in the course we will actually look at uh, the impact of these uh, different uh, grounding approaches on uh, the system. So, if you look at the, the model for a typical line. We, this is what we just discussed and uh, if you look at what happens during a, a fault such as a insulation fault or uh, some sort of short, uh, uh, short circuit fault, you can have different varieties of fault depending on your fault impedance. So, the question is what do you 
what number do you use for typical values of uh, say the fault impedance uh, in a fault scenario. Okay. So, would it okay to have Z f to be 1 per unit? Uh, that would not be reasonable because it means that your current that it is drawing is actually uh, just rated current. Again you will have to look at the section in which you are doing the calculation and normalize to, to, to that particular section. But uh, if you are looking at say uh, over current you might say your, your device is capable of a 20 percent overload or maybe a 50 percent overload, but uh, it is not often that you might put uh, two twice the rating as your overload capability. So, your fault uh, impedance might be uh, 0.5 per unit or it can be 0 per unit uh, 0 for a solid fault. So, you could typically also look at a range of uh, fault impedances depending on what you would consider the fault current level uh, in that particular uh, system. So, if you look at the, uh, the type of faults that are occurring in uh, typical systems, you would have uh, you would have single line single uh, single line to ground faults. So, in fact, 80 percent of uh, all faults people uh, have collected statistics and they are actually single line to ground type of faults. If you look at uh, uh, so, so, so the si single line to ground is the most common variety. If you look at uh, your solid three phase faults, uh, they, uh, they are much more rare. I mean it is typically around 5 percent of faults might be uh, three phase faults. But uh, the main benefit of uh, three phase faults in your calculations is that uh, your calculations are simple and uh, it is uh, something that you could readily calculate and then based on what would be the ratios uh, for the different uh, uh, varieties of fault types single line to ground, line to line etcetera, you could look at what variations can happen uh, around the solid three phase type of fault. If you in the next class what we will look at is we will also look at the DG models uh, and uh, based on that we could then go forward and actually look at uh, uh, some more issues before we start looking at what the fault current levels are in the system and uh, how to actually do coordination and the objective of looking at coordination in this uh, class is from the perspective of not to actually implement coordination which can uh, the, uh, coordination can be taught in an entire course. Our perspective is to look at uh, how coordination gets affected when you add a distributed generation system into your network. Okay, thank you.